Um, well, welcome everybody. I'm glad that you turned out on a Saturday like this. It's kind of you, and um, thank you, Julien, for having us here at the consulate. Um, the themes I'm going to talk about today vary quite widely, so we're going to jump in time from 300 years ago in Paris to Hong Kong. So, um, what I'm going to explain is sort of about what an archive is, what it is an archivist does, very briefly, because a lot of people are confused about that. Nothing to be ashamed of. I've had people, when I say I'm an archivist, they say, oh, like Indiana Jones? <laughs> and I just not go, uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Um, and uh, and uh, a little bit about what an archives is, and then I'm going to talk about how the modern concept of archives and the profession of archivists was born of the French Revolution in Paris. So I'll talk a little bit about how archives were before that, what happened in France, and where that direction led. And then I'm going to jump forward in time, 300 years, to Hong Kong from about... Uh, 2006 or so when I got here to now and talk a little bit about what's going on with archival awareness, with the growth of actual physical archives, with uh, archival education, with um, the, the push for archives law and freedom of information law here in Hong Kong, and, um, and then I'm going to end with a, my, my hopes <laughs> for what's going to happen. So um, I think what we'll do Ha! Is first, we talk a little bit about what are archives. Um, because archive is a word that gets thrown around quite a bit these days. Um, and basically, people use it as a verb, meaning to store. Like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to archive these. I'm going to archive these old issues of my publications. I'm going to archive my old web pages. I'm going to archive. Those are not archives. <laughs> okay? Those are collections of old things, but they are not an archive. Um, in particular, because generally they're collections of published materials, and we don't, that's not necessarily what we do. A library collects published materials. Um, they can also collect personal papers, manuscripts, and the archives of other organizations. Um, but an archive itself, the word, it can be the archive, the building, that houses the archives. This is where it gets confusing. It can be the building, the archive that houses the archives. It can be a collection within that building. But ultimately, an archival collection or an archive is the natural result of the work, the transactions, the policies and decision making of a government, an organization, or a business. It is the result of what you do. It is not something you collect because it's about a certain subject. It is not necessarily the personal papers of a person. Although in some cases, if the person is also the business, it can be, all right? So usually an archive, in its strictest sense, is a collection of the documentation that results from doing your business or doing your governance, you know? Or being a church or being a university. Right, we're in the business of education. So the so that the archives that, for instance, I run is the archives of Hong Kong U. And so it is the result of what Hong Kong U does and what the Hong Kong U family members do. So it is all of the official records of the university, the court, the council, the senate minutes, the faculty meeting minutes, the policy statements, um, the, the maps of the hierarchy, the employment information, the student information, um, the evidence of the courses that we've taught, um, the evidence of our programs, our requirements. Um, then we get on into the unofficial records, which are sort of the evidence of social activities, the lives of our faculty and students. Um, sometimes we collect personal papers, as in I would take the papers of a former vice chancellor or a prominent faculty member. They then become a part of the archives. But the whole thing revolves around that collection policy of we are the Hong Kong U archives, and Hong Kong U is the only thing we collect because it's not a special collection. So across the hall from us in the library, 
because the archives is a part of the administration, we are a separate unit, is special collections. Within special collections, they have some archival collections. For instance, they have the archives of Deacon's Law Firm now, which was just donated. They have um, archives of other Hong Kong businesses. They have personal papers and manuscript collections. They have collections of rare books and publications having to do with Hong Kong, because their area of collection includes the history of Hong Kong. So um, their collecting scope is much wider than ours, and they are not an archive, because they do not do what we do, which is exist as the archives of Hong Kong U. Okay? So Hong Kong U stuff in the archives, documenting the institution it was born from, that these papers were born from, right? And um, sometimes it's difficult for people to grasp this, because in an archive you may find personal papers, and in a special collection you may find an archive of a business or a, you know, or a, or a, uh, like a personal papers, a manuscript collection. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a distinction that not very many people are familiar with. And so nowadays, in the modern usage of the word archive, people say, I'm going to archive this, I'm going to archive that. They just mean they're going to store old stuff. And that is not correct. <laughs> okay? It sounds really good, though. It sounds pretentious, doesn't it? So, so people would much rather say, I'm going to archive this, rather than I'm going to store this, or I'm going to put it in a warehouse. Because the responsibility of the archivist is also records management. The records don't, we don't just sit there passively and say, oh, just bring us your old stuff, right? We're involved with appraising the value of records from the day they are created until the day the few of them that we accept are brought into the archives. Out of everything we produce in a year, we may receive 8 to 10 percent that have lasting, enduring historical value. The rest of it, gone. And the reason for that is because most of what we produce does not have enduring historical value. It has maybe importance as a vital record for a shorter period of time. It's the archivist's job to make sure that records are destroyed promptly and properly, in the case of like personal data, according to schedules which we set up for retention and disposition. And most of it is destroyed because it does not have a lasting historical value. The, the easiest example that I can give you is with financial records, which are voluminous. No matter where you go, government, private industry, whatever, it's the financial records that take up the most space. And we are required by law in Hong Kong to save records for tax purposes for seven years. Now, 20 years or so ago, America moved to a four-year retention which has helped a lot with the buildup of paper, but Hong Kong is still on a seven-year rule. So, we are required by the, by the IRD to keep certain financial records for seven years, and after that they can be destroyed, and they should be, because they take up huge amounts of space, and they are worthless after a certain point in time. What I look for as an archivist are those summary documents that give us the most information for the least amount of space taken up, and those are the ones that we keep forever and ever. Okay? Because that's where the meat is. That's where the researcher's going to want to look. He's not going to want to look at receipts and canceled checks and purchase orders. You know, which is what fills our, our cabinets. So, and it's the same thing with human resource records. It's the same thing with student records. It all gets squooshed down to those few pieces that are of permanent value to us. So, um, now we're going to talk about Paris. <laughs> and I, and forgive me, this is my, I never learned to speak French, so um, my pronunciation is, is, is horrible. Try not to laugh. Correct me later. Okay? <laughs> I need all the help I can get. Um, when Europe um, was uh, a more uh, under a feudal system of government. 
Of course we had archives, of course we had records. Many, many, many of them were kept by the church, which was the one big overarching organization to be found in every country, okay? They were not open to the public. Um, there was no concept of having to be accountable and transparent to like, voters or citizens. And, um, and most of the records were compiled and then were sort of evidence of things that had happened before but are no longer going on, right? And at the beginning of the French Revolution, this is when, because of the events of the revolution, because of the radical change in government from a monarchy to a republic, um, the, the modern ideas about archives um, were born. And now, here in Hong Kong, we're kind of undergoing a similar period of self-examination regarding how we keep records and what we do with them, and who should have access to them, and um, you know what, what our responsibilities are. And there's a growing recognition of the fact that, hey, you know, archives, that's a profession. The rest of the world is about 30 or 40 years ahead of us here which you will read not just as my opinion, that is in the Ombudsman's report that was released in March. Um, so one of the reasons why I like to give little talks like this is to raise that awareness and to get people acquainted with what's going on in Hong Kong with archives in these last few years. And um, so back to Paris. The first thing that you saw the little picture of before, that was a declaration of the rights of Bayon the first sort of, it's sort of the, the, the French version of the Declaration of Independence in the United States, which, by the way, big bow to France, there would be no United States without them, because they were the ones who supported us in the revolution, in our revolution. They were the ones who helped us to win the war, so. It was the hate of riches. Yeah, that too. And, um, <laughs> but, um, in fact, where I come from in Virginia, there are many, many, many French road names and place names because we were so grateful. So, General Rochambeau, Rochambeau Road runs right by my house, <laughs> you know, um, at the Battle of Yorktown, the, the Comte de Grasse. The French Navy had blockaded the British away from us. There are things named after him, the Marquis de Lafayette, who was Washington's aide de camp and, and uh, uh, brought supplies and troops, and, you know. Without it, without them, there would be no United States. So anyway, in September of um, 1789, in the Declaration, Article 15 states, society has the right to require of every public agent an account of his administration. This is the first time that they're expressing this idea that if you govern, part of your responsibility is to tell everyone what you're doing. Okay? This is not really ever been expressed before because the people who it's not that we didn't keep records before it's just that was something that was done for the king for the you know only certain people had access to it and the responsibility was to a very few guys who had all the power and then later on in 1794 um, this was under their new calendar so it was called seven messy door because they changed their their calendar for a while. So the real, the, the date that we would understand would be the 25th of June. So it's actually almost exactly 300 years. It's kind of cool. Um, <laughs> they proclaimed for the very first time that citizens have the right to access to public archives. This, had, this was huge. This had never been done before, saying, you know, you as a plumber or a, you know, a maid or a baker or whatever, you have a right to look at the government's records and to see what they're doing with what is essentially your money. You know, you pay taxes, it's your money. We are responsible to you to report about what we're doing with it. And you have a right to access them. So this is the beginning of the Freedom of Information Act. You know, America, who has the oldest Freedom of Information Act in the world, 1966, was merely following this precedent that was set in France at the end of the 18th century. So, this idea that the modern archive was born in Paris um, uh, is something that all archivists, when we go through our training, we study this. 
And um, Duchesne, who's uh, uh, published this in the American Archivist, our, our professional journal, said the modern administration of archives in Europe really began when it became clear that archives could no longer be considered only historical repositories. It was realized that they also had to receive, more or less regularly, papers originating from functioning institutions. So when the revolution first started, what they did was they took all the records out of the churches and the, the royal records rooms and the pe where the people in power had kept track of what they were doing. But those institutions weren't functioning anymore. There had been a revolution. These were all defunct things. You know, They had no power, and they weren't really functioning, and the records were of stuff that had already stopped. But, you know, it wasn't until a little bit later on that they began to realize that that's not good enough, that you must be receiving records regularly from the offices that are creating them if you want to keep track of what people are doing. And this is the beginning of records management in the modern sense that we know it now, where records are transferred regularly to the archives once they are no longer active, being used by the people who created them. Um, or at least not active very often, so you could call the archives and say, hey, I need, I need this, I need a copy of this. But um, this is it, this, this was the beginning at the end of the, at the, end of the 18th century. And so then we come to um, Napoleon, who decided that he would be first consul of the Republic and later emperor. But he knew, he knew how important it was to keep his power consolidated and to keep things running smoothly and to be responsible for the people because it was his, the people, his immense popularity that kept him in power. And he was the one who initiated this series of regulations on records transfers. He published a circular that went out to all the government offices ordering the regular transfer of the papers of the Public Works Division of the prefectures to the newly created Archive Department House. So they, he was saying, not, not good enough to give me just old stuff. You need to start regularly transferring your records so that we know what's going on and who is responsible. And then, I just love this picture. Doesn't he look confused? <laughs> but actually, I had a picture of him when he was younger and very, you know. But this, this is what we look like after a hard day in the archives. <laughs> 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 um, he's got that stunned look on his face, like, I can't look at any more paper. Um, anyway, this is um, Monsieur uh, Nathalie Duvelli, and he was um, kind of grandfather of modern archival theory and practice. To this day, there are two governing principles that rule everything that an archivist does. The first one is the one that he articulated as respect to form in 1841, the basis of all archival arrangement. Okay? When you go into a library and you want to look up information, you know that there's an artificial arrangement in place Right? It's either Dewey or Library of Congress or something like that, something similar. And under that, things as published materials, be it books or music or videos or whatever, they're arranged for you by author, title, subject, and publishing date. Right? But those are made up schemes to order published materials so that it's easier for the researcher to find them. Okay? And they work brilliantly, all right? That's not how archives are arranged. Archives are kept in the arrangement in which they are created. They reflect organically that which spawned them, okay? So when you go into an archive, you will find that all of the records are arranged according to the people who created them. And that creator, be it an office or like a single person like the chief executive, that is the phone, okay? And those records are kept together. Even if subsequent accessions come in to that record group, that phone, they're always intellectually kept together, but they might not be physically kept together. You know how when you go into a library, everything about in your section is right there and they have to leave room at the end of the shelves for collections that grow and 
not in an archives. We use every little bit of available space, and we really don't care if one office's records are scattered across three buildings. As long as we have the location tags to get to them, intellectually, they are all together. All right? They're still in that phone, that record queue. And so that's the first line of archival theory. It is followed by the second and equally important line. You never, ever mess with the original order. Because that in and of itself is historical fact. It shows you how the records were created and kept by these people. So you never change it. There is no artificial alphabetization or putting things in chronological order. The only time we ever do that is if we receive records that are in such a mess there is no original order that's discernible. And then we will step in and create usually either a chronological or an alphabetical way to get to them. But normally there is an order. We can figure out how they were created and that's exactly the way they stay. We simply create finding aids, which are the equivalent of a library catalog record. But a catalog record is a fairly brief, fairly brief document, right? Author title, subject headings, publishing date, publisher, um, maybe sometimes special notes if if um, it's warranted, you know, biographical notes or things like that. Whereas a finding aid to an archival collection can vary in size from a single sheet, like an archival collection can be one, a phone could be one piece of paper, or it could be 1,500 cubic feet of records. And the finding aid to a big collection like that can often resemble a notebook, because there in it will be a scope and content note about the whole collection. There will be a biographical note about the creator if it's a single person. There will be uh, administrative notes that comes from an office detailing the growth of the office, any name changes, what they did, their functions, that kind of thing. Then there will be box lists and folder lists. <laughs> you know, these can be really quite quite lengthy to help the researcher to get to the part that they need. All right. Respective fonts trumps everything. That's us on a bad day in the, in the archives. Ah! And, um, he said, in a government circular, all documents which come from a body, an establishment, a family, or an individual form a phone, and must be kept together. The documents which only make reference to an establishment, a body, or a family must not be confused with the phones of that establishment, body, or family. You see what I'm saying here? In a library, everything about X is in that section for X. That is not how an archives works. There might be references to that phone's function or somebody in it or whatever, but that doesn't make it a part of that group. Only those things that were created in that phone are kept together. So it's a different way of thinking about organization of records. And we mostly deal with unpublished stuff as opposed to like published books or music or things like that. So this is this is how that archival practice grew. Now, so France 300 years ago, through the 19th century, the profession of archivist is becoming just that, a profession practiced by professionals. This is happening all over Europe and in the United States. Some of the finest archival theory that refined on these two things that um, you the way they came up with came out of Holland. In the 1890s, it was three Dutchmen who got together and codified how to process archival collections to be true to Duhaley's theory. And so they nailed the practice. There are 89. <laughs> there are 89 rules for how you have to, to process an archival collection, and it was the French who, I mean, the, the, the Dutch who codified this. And on and on and on, and so we come to the profession of archives in the 20th century, where now, in order to be a professional archivist, it requires a master's degree um, and internships and special training and continuing education on all the facets of that. And it has spawned 
other professions that go along with it, like that of the archival conservatory. A conservatory is a different thing from an archivist. I have had conservation training. I know enough when I look at my collections to do what I call triage. So I decide what's in real crap shape, where I need to call in a professional conservator, and where we can do it in-house because it's surface cleaning or um, some mending that may not be taxes too hard. But when we need a professional conservator, that is a person who uh, generally has a chemistry degree and has trained to do conservation of a very specific field. And in fact, today we have a conservator among us. There's Miss, <laughs> Miss Dawn. Hey, hey. Um, Dawn um, Steele Pullman is an international paintings conservator. And her specialty is just that paintings. And so when I have a painting here, especially because yeah, I've used all before, when we have something to do with on you, we call Dawn and say, please, could you come and look at this and tell us if it can be saved? And she is the one who restored our painting of Sir Cecil Clementi and also our beautiful painting of Shum Ping San. She did all the restoration work on that. And now we're looking at a third portrait of our BC from the 30s, um, uh, William Cornell. Uh, often referred to as Big Bill because the painting is huge and he was kind of a big guy. And so now we're looking at that as the next big project. Um, but I'll tell you right off the bat, one of the reasons why we have difficulty right now hiring archivists in Hong Kong is because A, there's no professional level training here yet, and B, archivists and conservators don't come cheap. So it's difficult for people to make that commitment when they are not familiar with the profession and all that, that it entails. So in the last probably 10 years or so, Hong Kong has become more and more aware of its own public records, its own private records, archives of all kinds. It's been in the newspaper all the time. We're becoming aware of the fact that it's a real problem here that we don't have an archival law. And of course, we can't have a freedom of information law without an archival law because it doesn't do any good to say you have the right to have access to these things if, in fact, the records are not being created properly and saved. Without an archives law, you don't get the other one, or it doesn't do you much good. So, um, and I see, since I've been here, this kind of growth of archival repositories in universities and businesses, churches, NGOs. I see it everywhere. And so um, I want to talk a little bit about um, what's been going on in Hong Kong. We have a public records office. It's in Queen Tong. It's probably the best purpose-built archive space in Hong Kong. It's really nice. And um, it was built while Hong Kong was still a colony. The UK has its own set of archival law, and after 2001 or two, I think, they enacted freedom of information law. And um, the Public Records Office was run along those lines. It, too, was a part of the colonial government. Okay. When the handover happened in 1997, the Public Records Office continued to function, but now they had an entirely different set of responsibilities because now the records are not being created for some faraway government in London. Now the records are being created and we are responsible to whom? To the people of Hong Kong. Okay. It's, it becomes much more uh, locally focused and our accountability and transparency are to the people of Hong Kong, not to the colonial government, not to London, not, not overseas somewhere. So when they left, they left copies of everything for us. So up until 1997, we actually have a pretty good archival record in the public records office in Hong Kong. Okay. Since then, things have deteriorated rapidly. The reason for this is because there was not a push to professionalize the service 
when the rest of the world had already been moving that way. And the bureaucracy of it kept functioning. But slowly but surely, the few professional employees were kind of edged out. And rather than have an archivist at the head of the entire government records service, they began the practice of moving executive officers in and out of that role every three years. So you have a guy who's in charge of prisons, and then because he's a good administrator and he oh, he's put in charge of all the archives of records management for three years. Well, he barely has time to learn enough to do his job before he's gone, and another EO is rotated in. So that's one of the many problems with the system. The other problem, of course, is that there's no law underpinning it. So no one has to keep good records, and no one has to turn them over to the archives. And it's resulted in the destruction, and sometimes in the non-creation of records that really are, are very important. Um, so, I do kind of like this one. Can you read this in this slide? Uh -huh. yeah. It says, basically, um, it's, I don't know if I can read it down here. It's the two angels in the clouds looking at all the, the um, uh, file cabinets. And they're talking about it in conjunction with what we now call cloud storage. And cloud storage for archives. And they're like, it was much nicer before people started use, storing all their personal information in the cloud. <laughs> and this is all the stuff that's up there. So, um, so nowadays, what we have, what I want to talk about are some of the new um, archives and the kind of growing awareness of archives, the growth of archives themselves in Hong Kong um, of all different kinds, and about archival education and about this push towards archival law. It's been in newspapers and on the radio and on TV um, quite a bit. So first of all, let's take a look at the government archives. We have the Public Records Office that I was just talking about. And it was established in 1972. It moved to a dedicated archive building in 1997, the, one, the nice one in Quintong. Um, if you haven't been out there, visit. It's, it's well worth the visit. Then we have the Hong Kong Film Archive, which was established in 1999, and it moved to a dedicated archive building in 2001. It's in Wan Chai, it's fairly close by. It's, it's also a really nice facility, purpose-built to be a film archive. And then we have the LegCo Archives, which was established in 2012, which has dedicated space in the new Tamar government complex. And try not to laugh, I did not cut an archivist in half. It says, now employs 2.5 qualified professional archivists. The 0.5 is my mentee, <laughs> who was hired as a professional archivist, but in fact is now finishing his first year of his master's degree in archives and records management at the University of Dundee. So, so I count him as a 0.5. That's Garfield. <laughs> so, um, as far as I know, in the Government Records Service now, um, they have a qualified conservator. They have uh, one or two people who, whose work I think very well of, but in terms of professional qualifications, um, not, not so much. And this is not their fault, I'm not blaming them in any way. What we need here in Hong Kong to boost this growth in archives themselves, the physical archives, is professional staff to deal with it. So right now, the archive, the archivists who have professional qualifications have gotten them overseas. The next move will be to establish a master's program here in Hong Kong so that we don't have to go to the state of Canada or, you know, because even the Hong Kong people in my office, right, the Hong Kong they have gotten their education somewhere else. Our records archivist was educated in Canada. So, you know, it, it's great when we can find people like that, but it's pretty rare. So I'm hoping that that will be remedied. Anyway, so here are the pictures of some, that's the public records office, which is really kind of a nice building, and the film archives and then the wing at Tamar that has the LegCo archives, which was established in 2012. And this is kind of along the British model of having a separate archives parliament. 
separate from the government bureaus and departments. We do a, a similar thing in, in, in the states with the Library of Congress being separate from the National Archives. It's the, yeah. the Library of Congress is actually an archive. Don't ask me what. It's just a historically, that's the way the name came out. So, um, and then we have the growth of business archives in Hong Kong. Um, HSBC is probably the best well known. Um, they were established in 2004. They have two qualified professional archivists on staff and several of the people who would be what I would consider paraprofessional. Um, with Swire, now I put established in 2011 with a question mark because it might be 2010. I could not tell. Uh, it's, it's correct. It's correct? <laughs> Yay! <laughs> okay. I'm really glad about that. Um, I, was, I was sort of guessing and I was trying to call Matthew saying. No, 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 it's correct. It's 2011, but just. When we start, just have Bonnie. Uh -huh. Yeah, and then I joined in 2012. Uh -huh. And the last year, uh, Matthew and another archivist joined us as well. So now we have five people in our team. Fabulous. Yes. Uh, what's your name? Celia. Celia. I think we've met. Yep. Yeah. Sorry about that. I'm it's really okay. Bad. It's okay. <laughs> So that's the Swire archive. And they have a huge archive in London as well, as, as well at SOAS, sort of the overarching company thing. But they decided they needed a local one for Hong Kong, which I think is a brilliant move. Um, and then Deacon's archives, the law firm, it was established in 2008 and then just about a month ago was donated to Hong Kong U to the special collections. Because if you go back to what I told you before, you'll remember the Hong Kong U archives only collects Hong Kong U stuff. Deakins is the archive of a local business, therefore it is Hong Kong history, therefore that is more appropriately put in special collection because they collect Hong Kong history, including the archives of local businesses. And that was something I was really excited about because in 2006 when I came here, Deakins called me and said, would you help us? We have all these old papers and we need to, we need to get this. and I said, you need to hire a full-time professional archivist. I cannot do this and set up Hong Kong News Archives. And so I recommended a local professional archivist, Mr. Don Breck, who is really good. And he processed that entire collection, created finding aids, cleaned it up, got everything rehoused, asset free folders, boxes, blah, 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 blah. Then when it was all done, they realized they would have to have a professional archivist to provide access, to do reference services, to do reproduction work, to do all of those things that go along with keeping an archive. And they didn't want to build, you know, a very expensive archival storage space and hire a full-time archivist, so they gave the collection to a place where they would have those things. And most especially, most important to Deakins and most important to us was providing public access to the collection. So. Excuse me, is it Mr. Bridges or is it Mr. Mercer? I think it's Mr. Mercer. I may be wrong. It was my thought that it was Mr. Mercer. Um, but Deacon's, um, I don't know, you know what, maybe that is Bridges. I think that's Bridges. Well, actually, I'm just, I've been researching the Bridges Street Market, and I've been looking for a photo of that man. <laughs> Get with me afterwards. <laughs> I'll help you out with that. Um, yeah, so, um, you know, Deacon's has been around for a long time, since just nine years after the colony was established, and he, he, I'm telling you, they never threw away anything. <laughs> and the Deacon's collection is just fabulous. I mean, really, really good. As an archivist, the day that they brought it over, I was, I was looking at the stuff going, ooh, ooh, you know, because it was just, um, it's, it's so rich. It's got so much great stuff in there. And, um, and our, our head of conservation was looking at it going, oh my God, because <laughs> she has a lot of work cut out for her. Because um, as you know, the Hong Kong climate is not kind to our time. Um So um, after we talk about that, then we can talk about the Hong Kong Heritage Project, which was established in 2007. And it sort of has some of the archives of the Kaduri businesses in it, and um, was also involved with the sort of worldwide heritage project of getting archival materials up online. 
accessible to researchers on a much wider basis. And so, um, Hong Kong U was involved in that project. Lots of people in, here in Hong Kong were involved. Um, and uh, they too had kind of a nice facility, but it's it's not because it's a more private. There's some some of the I don't know that they have like a reading room, regular hours, that kind of thing. But it's nice to know that that the Kaduris are are interested in local history in this way, willing to support it to the tune of lots and lots of money. <laughs> um, Okay, so now we can talk a little bit about university archives. The oldest university archive was not at Hong Kong U. I was not the first. The oldest archives here is at HKUST, because even though the university wasn't founded until 1991 or didn't begin until 1991, in its establishment, it was decided we will have an archive. And it will be mostly electronic. We will see in the long run how that works out. Unfortunately, um, in my in my opinion, as a, a as an archivist, um, they decided that the archives would be a department of the library. Their Senate um, passed and codified an access policy, an open access policy to the archives, but they refused even after the urging of the first archivist who, like me, was brought in from the outside, to have any sort of archive statute um, giving the archives the authority they need to do their job. And therefore, there are some things that don't come to the archives at all, and um, things that people don't have access to for a long time. And so, I'm, I'm concerned about the HKUST archives for two reasons. One is because after the professional archivist who established it was let go after their first I think, three year contract, the people that are in charge of it now are basically librarians who had a little bit of training under this person and they're running the archives and they're doing the very best job they know how and they're doing a pretty good job, but they do not have the underpinnings from the authority of the school to do what they need to do. And while they have an open access policy, it would be a bit like Hong Kong adopting a Freedom of Information Act without an archives law. It does not do you any good to have access to something that's not being created or kept properly. If the records aren't there, what, what good is freedom of access? So then we have the University of Hong Kong archives. We were second, and that, um, uh, I came in the latter half of 2006. And by the way, don't get the idea that Hong Kong U was slow off the mark because it took them 90-some years to get around to building an archive. Let me explain. William and Mary was established in 1693. Do you know what the first year of their archives was? 1974. Okay. What, what generally happens is people, when they approach significant birthdays, begin to get more and more interested in their own past. And this is true of families, and also true of institutions, and also true of governments, and churches, whatever. As we get older, we begin to appreciate more those who come before us, and those who are coming after us. And we get this feeling like, God, we ought to be saving things. And that's exactly what happened at William & Mary in the run-up to the bicentennial of the United States, when most archives there, professional archives, were established in that decade around 1976. And um, it's the same thing that happened at Hong Kong. They were coming up to their 100th birthday and they began to realize that they needed to take care of their records a little bit better and to be able to provide more access to them. So um, then we have Hong Kong Baptist. Um, they have also their archives as sort of part of their library, um, special collections and archives. And it was established in 96, but the, the part that was established in 96 was not the university part, not the archives in the sense that I would think of it. They are actually more the archives of the Baptist Church and the missionary work that went on here. That's what they started collecting first. It wasn't until later that they thought, oh, 
university records, we need to do this. And that was a, then became an added component, hence the name Special Collections and Archives. So there's really like the archives of the church and the missionary societies, and then the archives of the university, and they're all together in one unit. And then Lingnan uh, University established their archives in 2012, again, as a small department within the library. And they had some hideously difficult stuff to get over because, as you know, Lingnan was founded in Guangzhou. And it was um, changed then at, during the war. Most of the Lingnan students came here to Hong Kong U, and they used our classrooms at night, and they used our teachers, and you know. And then after the war, when uh, China's government changed over in 1949, they couldn't go back. And so Lingnan stayed in Hong Kong, and what used to be Lingnan, all their beautiful old buildings, the campus, everything, became Sun Yat-sen University. And in fact, I just had a visit from the archivist um, at Sun Yat-sen a few weeks ago. It was really exciting. They're coming up on their 90th, they have their 90th birthday, and we're helping them with their archives and with their celebrations and stuff in November, which is great. But you won't believe it. Do you know where I had to go to meet the archivist from Lingnan? New Orleans. New Orleans, last August, she was at the Society of American Archivists meeting, and that's how I met her. And I said, but you're my neighbor. <laughs> yeah. So um, this is kind of a, a lot of growth, a, a lot of awareness. Now I think Chinese U is thinking about establishing an archive. Um, they've already begun collecting things, but they don't yet have an archive per se. And then these pictures down at the bottom, in case you're wondering. <laughs> this is um, from our collections, from a, a big exhibition we did at the Fung King San for our centenary uh, birthday, and um, these are some of the things that we had out on exhibition. This was taken in one of the galleries when we were talking about some of our collections and giving tours. This is kind of interesting. This came to us about two months before the exhibit opened, for three months before the exhibit opened. Somebody, a very nice man named Mr. Michael Tse, gave me two uncut sheets of these stamps. These were released um, by the British Post Office um, in honor of the 100th birthday of Hong Kong in 1941. And when the Japanese took over, these, of course, immediately went out of circulation because we were no longer running the post office. And they were not reissued and put back into circulation until 1946. So having these uncut sheets that his father had saved was pretty special, we thought. And we loved it, of course, because there's Hong Kong U. And that was the connection for us. There were a series of, I think, five or six stamps printed in that grouping for the birthday of Hong Kong. And this was the one with the university's picture on it, which is lovely, because by the time these came back into circulation, this hall no longer had a roof, and all of the wood in the main building was missing because it had been stolen, um, f mostly for cooking fuel. People were desperate. So then we look at church archives in Hong Kong. We have the, the Catholic Diocese archives, which I believe were established in '96. At St. John's, they have the archives of the Anglican Church in Hong Kong. I'm not sure, and they couldn't tell me when their archives were established, but they have been transferring their records to the Public Records Office since the 1970s, since it was created, which is great, because then they get cared for properly and you know, are not like in the church basement or something. <laughs> and then the Chinese Methodist Church archives, again, they did like deacons. They got their archives together and they donated them to Hong Kong U so that they could be cared for, so that access would be provided, so that they would be professionally handled. Because it's an expensive proposition to build an archive and hire an archivist. You have to have temperature and humidity control. You must have proper conservation supplies, which are very expensive. You must have professional archivists, and we're not cheap. <laughs> You have to have space, and in Hong Kong, it's at a premium. And 
um, you, you have to have staff in order to process collections and to be there for researchers and to provide reproduction services and to deal with copyright issues and intellectual property and all that kind of stuff. And it really does get very involved. So a lot of people, businesses, churches, um, social groups, you know, like the Boy Scout and people like that, rather than try to build their own archives, will donate their archives either to the Public Records Office in Hong Kong or to Hong Kong U or to one of the local history uh, museums. That happens too. So that brings me to other archival resources in Hong Kong. Um, a lot of cultural institutions and organizations have been or have begun collecting archival materials, either of their own or according to the particular interests of researchers. And those are what we call collecting, archi collecting archives. And they are not very different from the special collections. Really, that is a more appropriate title, a special collection. Um, they're not archives in the strict sense, but they do provide invaluable resources for, for researchers, and they add to this growing bunch of archival treasures in Hong Kong. And so we have the Asia Art Archive, which is in fact kind of like a, a special collections reference, uh, a reference and research collection for art in artists. Um, we have the Hong Kong Museum of History, which has archival collections. We have the Hong Kong Heritage Museum, which also has archival collections. We have the Comics Home Base, which if you haven't been over there, is a mighty cool building. It's fun to see. And um, they have archival collections of comic artists and artwork and business records and that kind of thing. And then we have the Hong Kong Art History Research um, Project, which was just established last year at the Hong Kong Museum of Art. And again, I think this is going to be very similar to the Asia Art Archive in not their collections, but their purpose and how they do things, like providing special research collections for, for people interested in that area of knowledge. In, archives, archival work. The first one is the East Asian Regional Branch of the International Council on Archives. The International Council on Archives is the overarching worldwide organization for professional archivists. And isn't it interesting? They're based in Paris. So back we go, 300 years to the place where modern archives were born. And the ICA's home is in Paris. And all of their publications are done in French and English, which is great. Um, I think if they would do French, English, and Chinese, we would hit almost every population on Earth. Well, maybe add Spanish. Yeah. <laughs> so, and then we have the Hong Kong Archives Society, which was established in 1996. And then we have the Archives Action Group, which was established in 2008. And um, this picture is of the Archives Society from a few years ago. And a lot of you may recognize Simon Chu. Helen Swinnerton from HSBC. Simon Tree used to be the government archivist. He's retired now, and he spends most of his free time agitating for archives law for Hong Kong. He, like me, is one of the founding members of the Archives Action Group. And archival education. Right now, and you can see that this has all happened within the last 15 years or so, um, we have education on a level to get people to what I would consider paraprofessional status for working in the archives. Postgraduate certificate in archival studies, an executive certificate in archives management, and an executive certificate in records management. These are all offered by Hong Kong East Space. They're sponsored by Eastica. They bring in wonderful teachers, archivists from all around the world to teach these courses. And, and it really is a good, solid program. Um, I'd like to see it bumped up to the next step, but um, the fact is we, we have these now and we didn't 20 years ago. This is more evidence. The growth of physical archives, the growth of interest in archival education, the growth in archival organizations, the awareness that the media are now you know, promoting in Hong Kong about archives, about what they're about. 
what our pupils do. So that sort of brings me to this part of my talk, developing an archival law for Hong Kong. And again, this is we're talking about increasing levels of awareness, but I wanted to give you some specific examples in the last seven years of important things that have happened to push us closer and closer to getting um, an archival law for Hong Kong. First of all, in 2007, Christine Lowe and the Civic Exchange published a white paper called Managing Public Records for Good Governance and Preservation of Collective Memory, the Case for Archival Legislation. That came out in March of 2007. I hadn't even been here a year when I read that. I had no idea at the time that we didn't have an archives law. I just was too new. And I had so much going on in Hong Kong U, I was not at that time paying attention to what was going on in the wider community. And that really opened my eyes. In 2008, we founded the Archives Action Group towards the end of the year. In 2010, and the Archives Action Group, by the way, is not a bunch of archivists. In fact, only a few of us are archivists. The people who make up the, the executive committee are judges and um, lawyers and archivists and just a lot of different people. Um, then, uh, in 2010, the Government Efficiency Unit did an investigation into the Government Records Service, and it was not good. It exposed a lot of the current problems with the Government Records Service and the archives. Again, don't get me wrong, when I criticize the system, I'm not criticizing the people who are trying to do the actual work there. They work very hard. They try to do a good job. They try to educate and get educated about what they're doing. The problem is that the system is not going to work until we have a law underpinning it. Because there, it has, there are no teeth, there are no sanctions. So, um, in 2011, following that, there were 11 stakeholder groups here in Hong Kong who testified before the Constitutional Affairs Panel about the need for archives and freedom of information law in Hong Kong. I know because I was one of the 11 people who had to stand up and testify. And we each had four minutes, and they had a blinking red light timer. So we had to talk really fast to get everything out before they went, eee, you're off. It was kind of like a horrible version of American Idol. <laughs> <laughs> so, so then in 2011, there was a follow-up paper, also published by Civic Exchange. This was the follow-up paper four years after the original one, called The Memory Hole. Why Hong Kong Needs an Archives Law. And it talked even more specifically about instances where records were not created or records were destroyed and it interfered with good governance and justice. So, then in 2012, we unfortunately, unsuccessfully tabled as a member's bill Archives Law at LegCo. There was only one vote against it. One vote was Stephen Lau. Then we had eight in favor, and we had 27 abstaining. You know, it's a, it's a, it was a major piece of fence sitting, frankly. And so that didn't work, so then we regroup. <laughs> we tried to continue talking with the media, talking with the press, getting the word out. Um, and in 2013, the Law Review Commission convened and decided that they would create two subcommittees to look into first archival law and simultaneously freedom of information law. And I was fortunate in that I got, Rimsky Hume called me and said, would you sit on the archive subcommittee? And I said, yeah, sure I would. Um, because they needed that one archivist. <laughs> because everybody else are sort of uh, legal, legal people, and um, uh, bureau heads, the director of administration, the director of China affairs, people like that. So that we we convened for the first time last uh, summer, and we are moving forward with investigating legislation in other countries, seeing how we do things here, seeing what it's going to take to put together an archives law that would be a good fit for Hong Kong. 
And then in 2014, just this last March, the Ombudsman finished up their year-long review of the Government Records Service again. This is following up on what they've done in 2010-11. And the Ombudsman's report came out in March, and it was an absolutely scathing denunciation of the Government Records Service and the problems with the system. Again, not the people, the system. And all of you are welcome to read it. If you go to the Archives Action Group homepage, you can get a link to the Ombudsman's report, or you can go to the Ombudsman's website and read the report. They were quite frank about the shortcomings of our current system. And I think that's the thing. Every single person that I've run into in this sort of long road this last seven years of pushing towards more awareness, more education, better, better, you know, more professionalization of, of the of archivists, more, uh, you know, moving towards an archives law for Hong Kong. Every single person that I've run into, no matter what side of the fence they're on, they are motivated by their love of Hong Kong because we want to do something that makes a difference because this is our home. And um, I can't stress that enough. You know, occasionally things get fairly quarrelsome. But at the end of the day, what we want is what's best for Hong Kong and the Hong Kong people. So, after I've just bombarded you with all this for the last couple of hours, I'm going to tell you what my hopes are. And this is what I see as a professional archivist. I think these four goals are attainable for us. I wish they'd happen a lot faster than they, than they are, but I do think they are attainable. The first is archival law for Hong Kong. The second is freedom of information law for Hong Kong, because every single thing that I've talked to you about today, the establishment of all these archives, the training programs, the, the growing awareness, this is all going to be helped pushed further on down the road, supported by passage of those two ordinances. The third thing is an accredited global master's degree program in archives and records management to support the implementation of these laws and to support the growing profession here in Hong Kong. That's our next step in terms of education. And then four, as a result of the first three, I see a continuing growth in employment opportunities for archivists in Hong Kong, resulting in better care of our recorded heritage, better governance, and most of all, a life enriched by access to our shared past. And it's already happening. There are already people here in Hong Kong who are working in the archives field, and I bet you 10 years ago, a lot of them didn't even know what an archivist was or what went on in an archives. So it is growing. It's already a fact. And I'm, I feel very positive about all this stuff. Especially when I get a chance to come and talk to new people about it and to get you excited about it too. Because oftentimes, you know, people say, oh, archives and records management, yawn. You know, they think it's really boring. It's not boring. You know? I've been passionate about this for more than 20 years. Archives touch everything we do on a family level, on your community level, in your church, in your government, everything we do. And I want to get you guys as fired up about this as I am. So thank you very much for coming. Thanks for being here. Now, questions. <laughs> Setting up uh, archives in Hong Kong, a lot of people try to do it uh, shortcut way, you know, or what they think you know, is uh, more relevant to uh, to the modern world. There's uh, electronic archiving. So, mm -hmm. what, what do you say to that? Um, it's a good thing. That is going to be the way of the future. Um, but it's a, I think it's a little bit scarier road than most people are aware of. Um, I'm in the middle of getting certified as a digital archive specialist. And oh my god, has it been a steep learning curve. <laughs> but what I can tell you as a practicing archivist is this. In the current state of our profession, 
given proper support, we can save original paper records for six or seven hundred years. Okay? Digital records have only been around for about 25 years in their modern form. Maybe 20 years in their modern forms. Digital records, by their very nature, are inherently unstable. Okay? They're magnetic. Think about it. It takes really very little effort to destroy or alter digital records or to share them inappropriately. <laughs> and, um, or to, you know, it's difficult to keep them secure. It's difficult to keep them from deteriorating. It's difficult to constantly migrate and translate them up to the next configuration of hardware and software because they're the built-in obsolescence. Because most of the formats we use and the hardware we use it on are proprietary. Okay. So archivists all over the world have been struggling with moving towards um, keeping electronic records, particularly now records that weren't just digitized copies of hard copy but were born digital, like websites, and keeping them for long periods of time because frankly they haven't been around enough long enough for us to talk about long periods of time. You know, to an IT guy, 10 years is a really long time, right? It's ancient history. But to an archivist, 500 years is, you're just doing your job. So we have a completely different mindset. And so now we're talking to each other more and more and more about how can we overcome this? How can we do it? And we're working with what we call archival formats of electronic records. We're working on things, doing, doing things like keeping what we call the dark archive, right? Which is a server that is never allowed to be accessed which is continually checksum so that we can track deterioration of the records. Those records then are moved to what we call the light server, right? the dark server and the light server. The light server is the one that provides use copies for researchers, but never does data go backwards the other way. Right? So it's because the archivist is responsible for guaranteeing the authenticity of the records that they keep. Part of our job is <clears throat> trust. You know, people have to have trust in the archives. They have to be able to depend on the fact that if they come to you, you're giving them the real deal. It's not been tampered with. It's not been altered. There's a paper trail, an audit trail. It's the real thing, and no one can argue with it. It is admissible in court. It's really difficult to do with electronic records. So yes, we're working on it, and yes, it's a huge, huge question. Yeah. Because believe it or not, people often say, yes, but you don't have to have all that space, so it must be much cheaper to keep electronic records. It's not. Do you know that it is actually about five times more expensive for me to keep an electronic copy of something than it is for me to keep a piece of paper? Five times. Why? Personnel, equipment, proper, you know, you got to keep big servers in a, in, a, in a special environment, just like you do hard copy archives. You must have elaborate backup systems, and not just one. And they have to be in geographically different places. Yeah. Oftentimes what we do now is keep hard copies in one place and digital copies in another. Probably another two or three. Yeah. It's because it's not cheap to buy this stuff, the equipment. Go ahead. Um, actually, how many archivists uh, are there in Hong Kong? And <laughs> also, um, uh, well, how expensive is it to hire you guys? So after you're pro uh, talking about, uh, well, you, you're hoping that um, more young people um, I can get into the business. Yeah, I, I have two mentees yeah. right now working on their I master's. They, they, re, yeah. they really want to know how the career path is like. And mm -hmm. also, I'd like to know the situation in Asia. Um, for example, compare, compare with Macau or Singapore, or even mm -hmm. mainland China. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you something. I am peed green with envy every time I think of mainland China. They have a really, really fabulous setup 
for their archivists. They have a very strong professional association, which also happens to be a labor union. All right. They have, they have oh work. yeah, the, the Chinese Society for Archivists or Chinese Archive Society. I'm not exactly sure how it translates into English. Um, I've been up to visit with them on an official visit. I've seen the municipal behind the scenes and municipal archives in Beijing and Shanghai. Oh my God, do they have money and staff and beautiful archives and gorgeous reading rooms and huge digitization projects because labor is not such a problem for them. Also because they have a long, long history of revering the importance of archives and of, of what an archivist pr provides for the society and for the government. And um, to give you an example, Zhejiang University, which is now the biggest university in China, I think they have five different campuses. They employ 27 full-time professional archivists. You know how many I have? Oh, three. All right. uh, are they all trained <laughs> in China? Or? Pardon? Uh, are they all trained in I honestly don't know them all, so I, I can't really answer that. But they have, in every single office across all five of their campuses, they have a records officer who reports to the archivist. 220 of them. And there is a regular flow of the proper records from the offices and, and faculties of the university into the central archives. They really do a bang up job. And surprisingly enough to me, because you know I have my prejudices as an American, I, when I first heard about archives in China, I thought, oh, well, they're probably all closed. Probably no one's allowed to look at anything. I couldn't have been more wrong. Quite a lot of it is open. Quite a lot. And if you want a treat, if you really want to see what a good professional archives looks like, you can either go to Quintong to see one on a smaller scale here in Hong Kong, or you can get yourself up to Guangzhou and go to the provincial archives up there. Because let me tell you, it is gorgeous. It is just gorgeous. Huge modern appointed reading room computers everywhere, beautiful finding aids and cases along the wall, and hard copy, gorgeous exhibition space. You know, nine floors of stacks. It's really, really good. And, and they even archive stuff before 1949? Um, there's not a lot left because a lot was destroyed during the Cultural Revolution. So it's kind of like what I have. I have a similar problem here, and I had a similar problem at William and Mary. War. You know, there's not a lot from the war years or from before. I've seen trading records. Yeah. Let's go back to the 1900s. Yeah, yeah. There, there's some, but comparatively, there's not a lot. Just like I don't have much pre war stuff, and when I do find it, I'm like, yeah, give it to me now. You know? So, um, insofar as the archivist training and education goes, what I'd like to see is us expand from Hong Kong space and build, an each, uh, and build a master's program. And of course, I'm prejudiced. I want it to happen in Hong Kong U. I'm a Hong Kong U girl, you know, so I, I want it to happen there. But that may not be the way things pan out. I just don't know yet. But we're talking. Everybody's talking about it. And um, I have two mentees right now who are finishing up their graduate training overseas. Um, one is working at the Legend Archives, and the other one is actually at the university doing her second year um, Glasgow. And, um, As far as professional, what I would consider professional archivists, there's probably fewer than 10 of us in Hong Kong. That does not mean that there's not great archives work being done by people who I might consider, you know, not exactly at a professional level. They've had some training, they've had some job experience, they've, they're doing a pretty decent job. But what I want to see is an increasing professionalization, you know, and respect for the job. And no, we're not we're not inexpensive. How accessible to the public must be the archives in Hong Kong? Fairly accessible. Um, the government here has a, a thirty year rule, which you know to, you have to take everything I say with a grain of salt. So it's need to get into the wall. I mean, how? No, 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 you can walk in. You can call Bernard Lim, make an appointment. So you need to make an appointment at most of the archives then? I would because it's only polite and also because if you want to get as much possible done while you're there with your valuable time, it is best to email ahead, tell them what you need, outline your research, you know, or set an appointment to go and talk to them about it because the archivist is your, is like your, your, your Sherpa, 
they're going to get you up the mountain to what you need, right? And so you need to spend time with them. Is that the same with your rock car? Yeah. yeah. You know why it's the same with mine? I don't even have a blessed meeting room. Uh, Until we move into our new home in the main building of Hong Kong U, which is where we're going to be, um, I'm still in that temporary space, and um, we have no reading room. So basically, you have to call us up, and, and I have to put you at a desk literally next to the stats. You know? But uh, to go to the library of Hong Kong U... Uh, that's a different you, thing. Yeah, it, that's different, is it? Okay, yeah. that's fine. My, our office is in the library, and then I have I, then I have archive space in, in Aberdeen, and I have space in the main building, and then we'll be moving our offices down to the main building, um, I think the end of 2015, please, Lord. And, um, but, but right now, we don't have a reading room, so I've got two tables where I can put researchers, which means you need to make an appointment. Plus, I like to know ahead of time, and all archivists like to know ahead of time, what you're looking for, so that we can be of most service to you while you're there. Because it's not like a library. I can't just go, oh, get on the electronic catalog. And, you know, because the stacks are closed. Everything that you want to look at, we have to bring to you, one box at a time. Just like an archive anywhere else. Yeah. yeah. And I'm also wondering, is the... Um leaning or uh, almost race towards history which has been happening in Hong Kong certainly for the last five years and maybe longer than that where Hong Kong people now are very interested in collective memory and um, wanting to know about their past which they haven't been before. Mm. Um, do you think that will be helpful to you? Oh yeah, I think it already has been. And, I, and I'll tell you something, I owe big kudos to my sweetie, Ho Yin, um, because he and his ACP people paved the way for the archives people. It was the growing interest in preservation of our built heritage that led then to the interest in our archival heritage, which got me here. And so now, so they're about 10 years ahead of our archivist curve. More and more people in Hong Kong are very aware of our built heritage now. And what I'd like to see is the same thing for archives. You know, we're kind of following in their shoes. I can totally relate to uh, what Stacey has been saying about um, professionalizing these disciplines so that people get the respect and the recognition. And, uh, but it's not so much for the people involved, but really for, for the job they're doing you know, so that it's taken seriously and done it to an international uh, standard. That's so, the thing, international the thing. standards. Yeah. And uh, for conservation, the same thing. For a long time in Hong Kong, any architect, speaking as an architect, would come to you and say, oh, I know conservation. I can do a conservation project anytime. You know, do they? No. In the past, you know, they screw up you know, every thing. And they would, they would have to wreck a building you know, and, and thinking that this is good conservation, whereas this is not. And a uh, historian would come to chess and say, I know conservation because I know about history. No, it's not true. Because what they can produce are fabulous history, okay, um, explaining the story behind a certain place, for example, a building. But as to how to carry out the conservation, no, they have no training, they have no knowledge. And this is not something, uh, not, not my opinion. This was told to me by Michael Morrison, uh, who's a uh, conservation architect uh, for the Central Police Station. It's from the UK. He said that uh, this happened in the UK uh, as recent as uh, 20 years ago when um, there's a need uh, to uh, produce a conservation plan for any conservation project. So at the time, there's little understanding about what conservation means, especially architectural conservation. By the way, these are, yeah, we're all in the same program. <laughs> Proud yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, so Michael, Michael told me, uh, said that at the time, so what people did is that they had to engage historians. So as a result, the so-called conservation plan is a big volume of history. So, I mean, it's a great read. So, after reading through this plan, you know everything about the history, the historical background of the building. And then, how do you do the conservation? There's nothing there. Nothing there. So, so, but today we tend to understand more. Today, in Hong Kong, we have an uh, undergraduate program, a uh, postgraduate program in conservation, and also we have an institute, a professional institute to support uh, professionals and the government. Finally, you know, has uh, uh, require uh, uh, for government uh, conservation projects. You know, they require a trained conservationist to be on the 
in the team. And uh, that the, the pro and uh, this uh, person, this professional must have a uh, membership in the this team. Yeah, and that's what I'd like to see eventually here, is that, is that we can train our own professional archivists and that the government, that there will be requirements for people working for the government record service at a certain level to be professionals yeah. in that field, and not just some EO who's a good administrator but really has no clue. Yeah. I mean, this is the only way to assure quality on the job done. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, just like any profession, you know, public profession, like you may be trained in uh, medicine with a medical school, but if you're not a qualified doctor, if you're not a registered doctor with a medical council, you can't practice. I mean, who, who's going to guarantee your work? So, the same thing. So, you're also saying, going back to the historical side, um, you've had a lot of um, issues with finding anything uh, from 1941 to 1945. Yeah. Hey, what about the UK? Have you looked at anything? Oh yeah, there's a ton of stuff there. Yeah. But we have what? copies of a lot of the things oh, there sure. in the government here, in the PRO. So it's not a question of you know, having to go to the UK except for cert certain papers. But, um, but like the CO 129, we have a copy of Hong Kong U of the colonial office papers that have to do with Hong Kong. And, you know, it's, that's, not a, that's not a problem. The thing uh, with the university is, is that a lot of our papers were smuggled out by faculty and students who took off for eventually Chongqing. And some of the papers, in fact, were given away. And, um, and the ones that did uh, make it back there were about 80 cubic feet left of the records, and the secretary, or secretary, the registrar after the war, and his um, uh, secretary, the secretary of the VC, um, they went through and reduced that to about 20 cubic feet, from 80 to about 20. We wouldn't have anything at all without them, okay? So yes. I'm grateful. But they were not archivists, and I just shuddered to think what could have been in that other 60 feet that they threw out. Um, we were lucky, we are still lucky in that things drift back to us one by one. And in fact, um, I buy things at auction. You know, I did the same thing at William & Mary, except for at William & Mary I had private money to spend, and here I don't. I spend my own money. And then sometimes if it's a bit too much for me, I ask for the university to, to reimburse me. But photos, the other day I got a really nice 1935 autograph book, how students used to do that, little autograph books, not, not like, uh, yeah, so it's, it was, and it was from a female student in 1935. We didn't have that many co-eds. Mm -hmm. So it was really important. It had one photograph in it and a bunch of drawings and poems and little notes to each other. It was a really nice piece of student life. It's a wonderful find. Yeah, it really was. But it, you know, it set me back 500 US. It's not cheap. So, so that's, you know, when I, when we find these things, you know, we try to get them. It's difficult because I don't, I don't feel that we can spend public money building the collections. Therefore, everything has to be a gift. Do, do you ever go out into like social media, looking like with requests for things from students in the Hong Kong? I do through Hong Kong U. I do through the DAO office, the Development and Alumni Affairs. Okay. We go through the bulletin and, yes. and the magazine. So every once in a while, at least once a year, and then I send out stuff. Does that bring anything back to you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I've been really lucky. One guy, oh, this was fabulous, just in time for our exhibit. One guy was walking along the road, like, you know where Portobello Road is, Portobello Market in London? It, they sell a lot of junky flea market stuff, but there's also some really upscale antique stores and stuff there. Anyway, he saw this really crap, crappy old picture frame, blah, 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 and something Hong Kong Yu caught his eye. He pulled it out of the trash and he sent it to me. And it's an enormous formal portrait of the 1926 Engineering Society. Here is one girl <laughs> sitting in the front row. And I didn't have a picture of her up until that point. And so, and even better, even more unusual, everybody in the photo was identified. That's very exciting. So we had to pop the frame and stuff and get everything taken off of it because it was disgusting and filthy and acidic. Then we had to clean up the photo and, you know, but it, I, I was so excited to have it. And a lot of times that's the way things come to us, just serendipity. Yeah. yeah. Uh, 
probably a coach student at the uh, Savannah College of Art and Design in Hong Kong. Uh -huh. which in Hong Kong. Cool building. It is very nice. I love going to school there. So my interest is about primary, primarily photographic. And I'm also doing um, well, my MFA um, project is to document some heritage and vernacular architecture in Hong Kong. Vernacular architecture, okay, yeah. And I'm also doing this like, in the um, standards for archival photography. I think it would say it has. Like, you have to have, they have to be in the, um, taken with a uh, 4x5 film, black and white, and then you straight. Those are international standards, and yes, I have standards like that in our archives. Um, I have two separate standards. One is for archival photographs um, uh, that I, when people say to me, like, you, how would I do this if I really want you to be, you know, take my collection in or whatever? I would prefer a larger negative. I prefer to have a set of negs and prints. I would like to have um, everything in black and white because it deteriorates much less rapidly than color. Color is not a happy thing after about 10 years. Um, however, it doesn't mean I don't take things that don't meet my standards either if I can salvage something. Um, uh, in digital photography, I would prefer that you put everything into um, JPEG 2000. That's an archival format. TIFF files are too big for us to load everything onto, but JPEG 2000 pretty much does the trick. For now, that's our best bet. But your first preference is still film? My first preference is a, a set of negatives and a set of prints, and preferably in black and white. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I tell all my friends when they're getting married that they should put those little black and white disposable cameras on every table and take candid shots at the wedding, because often now people take, you know, videos and things of digital and I don't know how long they're going to last. You remember when it used to be really popular to video your wedding on, on um, VHS tape? Most of those are unreadable after about 10 or 12 years because the tape deteriorates. You can buy the recorded. Yeah. So, so a lot of people of my generation video their weddings and stuff and then not all of that stuff is you can't even get it. It's not, they either don't have the thing to play it on or they don't, you know, and every time you migrate, say from VHS to a disc, you lo you're losing, you know, it's lossy medium. So, yeah, it's a problem. And you were asking earlier, the part of your question I didn't answer directly, which was, um, what do you mean you're not cheap and, and how much could an artist expect to make, right? That's what you wanted to know. <laughs> um, it depends on the archive that you work for. It also depends, of course, in, like any other profession, on the level of your education and the number of years of experience, particularly specialized experience. I don't know about the profession as a whole. I can tell you that as an academic archivist for the last 20 years, um, it depends, again, on where you work. You know what I mean? So the first half of my career, I was more familiar with the, with a, with a, well, the first 15 years with the American kind of scale for archivists. Um, I can tell you that sometimes you'll want to work someplace so badly because of all the cool stuff they have that you will accept less money, which is exactly what I did when I went and spent nine years at William & Mary. It's hugely prestigious. The collections are fabulous, out of this world, stuff that I couldn't even dream of when I was in school, like Washington and Jefferson letters, you know, things like that. So they don't pay as well in the South. And that's just the way it is. I didn't care. I just wanted to go to Williamsburg. You know, that was all I wanted. Um, archivists who work for universities, archivists who work for research facilities, or corporate archivists tend to make better money. Public um, archives like local history archives and things like that don't usually pay as well. You make more money if you go into the administrative end or you specialize or if you become a conservator. Yeah, because they are quite, quite in demand. But that requires a degree in chemistry, and oftentimes as long as seven years apprenticing. It's, it's you know. So um, an archivist here, I can give you an idea of scale. A professional archivist here would start somewhere around 40, 42,000 a month for a professional position. That's where they would start. At the university. university. Yeah. You guys would know this anyway when I post jobs, you know. So um, that's where about where you would start. And then as you get 
you know, further along in your career, more years of experience, and it goes up. So uh, you're never going to get rich being an archivist, but you will be able to pay like the electric bill. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know you said that library dimensions and archival dimensions, but yes, you also have a degree from Hong Kong University for library and information management. Mm -hmm. Is it easier? Uh, someone to it's actually more difficult. Is it? Yeah, and I'll tell you why. Because I have to untrain the library. I have to get them to stop doing stuff like that. Yeah. So it's easier for me to take somebody with a master's in history, or um, or uh, uh, a business person with a real interest, or an IT person with a real interest in records management. It's easier. That, but this is different in every country you go to. Like in America, weirdly enough, they see records management and archives as two separate professions. It is just bizarre because no one else in the world does that. Okay? And, and they often have archival components to library degrees where they major in that. Okay? I tend not to hire people like that unless they also have a master's in history or at least an undergraduate degree in history. I need someone who understands what it is to do primary source research and to work to that level, because, because that's who we serve. Yeah? Speaking of that, there's funny, uh, because uh, uh, well, since I'm involved in teaching conservation, people ask me, is it, is it easier to study conservation if you have an architectural background which train as an architect? And no. <laughs> Speaking as an architect, because our training is to tear down old buildings, to build new ones, you know, and we want to work with developers. You know. So, so, so for me, even to teach conservation, I have to untrain you know, my, my training <laughs> to, to get into the mindset of conservation. It's, a, it's kind of the same thing. Yeah. I'll tell you something. When, when I look for people to hire and whom I hope I could send through the space program and get them more training so they can become a paraprofessional and be like an archives assistant, a senior archives assistant, something like that, I look for people who have the same kind of skills that a really good clerk would have. Clerk. Clock. Yeah, clock. A meticulous attention to detail, a dogged determination to get to the end of the job. Because archives work can be really boring, the actual processing of, of materials. The reason why I look for the history degree is because they must have that contextual knowledge. Right? So in Virginia, I looked for people who had knowledge of academic history, the history of Virginia, the history of the United States, context the background to make decisions about what to keep, what to throw away, how to, you know, how to describe things, how to fit that in. And here, it would be someone with a knowledge, good knowledge of local history, Hong Kong, South China, um, yeah. And, and, but the attributes I'm looking for are uh, flexibility. Listen, archives work can sometimes be very not glamorous, very unglamorous, really. Filthy, <laughs> boring, boring. <laughs> no. Architect, sexy. Archivist, not sexy. Not sexy. <laughs> it's true. And, and, and I can remember being in situations where my poor graduate students, honest to God, I was at Michigan State University for four and a half years on the faculty there as the university records archivist. I had grad students, you know, working for me. We got a call that uh, they were going to shut down, well, this is a big ag school, you know, it has a farm and livestock and all that stuff, but aside from the regular university. There were 42,000 students there when I left, so it's an enormous place. And we got this call saying that they were going to shut down the dairy building um, um, and some of the other buildings there where they do animal products and food and things. Um, and they had found a, a locked vault in the sub-basement of this building that was built in the teens. And it looked, they had opened up, they had blown the door, they had opened it up, and they had found a bunch of archival stuff in there. Would I come look at it? So we go down and look at it. There were roaches, I swear to God, this big, climbing up the walls. It was stinking. It was, uh, so I said, okay. So we got plastic bags and tape. We taped up our trousers and things, and we wore rubber gloves, and we went and masks, and we went and we bagged up all these records and sealed them shut. And then we rolled them down the hall to walk in sub-zero freezers to kill all the tiny livestock 
so that we could then take them back into a, the prepping room. Because you don't put stuff like that in with your other collections, the next thing you know, everything's been eaten. <laughs> so we put it in there, and in the meantime, the department head who called me about this had a heart attack. I didn't know this. He's in the hospital. I get no call. I think, when am I supposed to go back to this building and pick all this stuff up? So finally I call, find out he's in the hospital, and they've already turned the electricity and the water and everything off in this building preparatory to the wrecking ball you know, coming in. So I grab my graduate students and we get a truck and we go over to the building. There's no lights. We have to go down into the sub-basement. There's no elevator. We got flashlights. We got all our trousers taped up. There's rats. Okay, we go into this freezer. Everything has melted. The stench is indescribable. We pull all these records out and then we have to pony them up the stairs ourselves. This is not light. Archival boxes weigh about 40 pounds a piece. You know, up six flights of stairs with no air conditioning, in the dark, with disgusting animals all around. You know? And that stuff like that happens, you know? I got called in to look at records in Hong Kong U when I was first here that they put in a in a like a storage closet behind some hot water pipe pipe <laughs> things, you know? And as paper acidifies, what builds up in it is sulfur. And we opened the door to that closet, and it was like the world's most giantest fart. <laughs> it was terrible. We opened the door and went, oh, and we, <laughs> we had to turn fans on and stuff before we could get in there and pull, pull all the records. You know? So sometimes it's just not very glamorous. And sometimes, and sometimes the work is very tough, and it's physically demanding. But then sometimes, you know, People call up, like the first year I was there, and they say, you won't believe what we found. We found a, a, a solid silver model of the main building given to Governor Lugard in 1916, and it's yours if you want it. So there are good days, too. Anyway, thanks. Thanks very much. Thank you. My Chinese history is shaky at best, but um, uh, historically, the, the emperors of China, and, and, and not so much the emperors, but in particular the prime ministers, <laughs> recognized the importance of underpinning the government's authority by having control of the bureaucracy. Uh, really. It's, and there's a very famous tale about this um, in in Chinese literature about the prime minister who, you know, other the emperor said, you know, bring me the most important things, you win the battle, blah blah blah. This prime minister went straight to the opposing people's archives, packed up everything, took it home, you know, to in this newly conquered territory, and it turned out to be the most single valuable thing that he could have done because it allowed them control of, of important bureaucratic stuff, like the salt trade. And when you pay your army in salt, that becomes fairly important. So um, there's a long history of recognizing that um, controlling the archives and having good records is a part of good governance. You know, a well-governed country has good archives, has good records management, is responsible, keeps a record of what they do. And I think especially after the Cultural Revolution when so much was destroyed, in the aftermath, you know, 15, 20 years down the road, there was a real sh sharp shock, a real sharp lesson there for people about what happens when these things get destroyed, how much they lost, how bad it was, you know. And so there's been a real effort since then to collect, document, to preserve, to get this stuff done and do it right. And um, 
And the nice thing is, is that they're also very open and exchanging with archivists from other countries. And we visit each other back and forth, and we learn from each other. Because they do things slightly differently than, say, people would do in the archives in the West. Because it's a different tradition behind how archives are kept. But at, at, the, at the core of it, it's all the same profession. I mean, I, I was surprised you know, to find out how open the, the, the archive in Mainland China is. Uh, uh, um, and, um, and then ultimately, I realized that they're, they do not just keep things for themselves. They want to keep things so that the public can access it. That's the part that was surprising. Yeah, they're very, they're very, and they're very much more open than I thought they would be. And if you want a good example of someone who uses archival resources to write fairly modern history, take a look at Frank Cotter's books, Mao's Great Famine, and I think the one that just. Mm. Good one. There's, a, there's another one that came out about um, drug culture in Hong Kong that he's done, and, and, uh, and there's a new one coming out uh, about, Ch about being in China, and he uses archives up there all the time. Okay. So it isn't just open to Chinese citizens. They're open. So I think that's really important. Um, and to researchers from around the world. And um, yeah, that's, they're setting us a good example. Okay, with that, we'll have a round of applause. Thank you. Please surprise me with today's story. Quite boring. Quite honest, but no. no. And, uh, the next, the next uh, lecture next week will be uh, interesting because you know it, it, it will be presented by two sexy grammarless architects. You know, not boring. Uh, not boring architects. <laughs> and uh, it's going to be interesting. Tell your friend. Uh, they are going to present a project uh, about um, the connection of um, Meifu with uh, France. You know. So how is that connected with France? You know. So and uh, yeah, this is going to be interesting. Uh, how do come? Okay, thank you. Broadcast up.